evening and god bless you brothers and sisters this is scott bradley coming to you with this day a beautiful day a day that the lord has made and we are rejoicing and glad in it we're grateful for another opportunity that we have to come this week to share with you what the lord has laid upon our hearts and we appreciate all of you that view us whether you be local or whether you be abroad uh we thank the lord we've been getting correspondence from all over the country as well as locally but we thank god for you and i hope that these uh, times that we spend these 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 weeks that we come to you uh, in this moment sharing with you the word of God that you are inspired and that you are hopeful as you continue to walk with the Lord. I believe it's the desire of the Lord to draw us closer to him. When we walk closer to him, he reveals things to us. When we walk closer to him, he puts things in our spirits, in our hearts and in our minds, and he comforts us even when we go through our valleys and our shadows and our troubles. You know, I think it's very interesting, and let me open this up by saying, I think it's very interesting, as I was reading the other day about the first century church, how many of them had suffered, how many of them had died. Uh, even Apostle Paul on the eve of his execution wrote the letter to Timothy and said that my time is at hand. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of life. Now, here's a man who was writing this to Timothy on the eve of his execution. Uh, history tells us that Paul was beheaded uh, by Nero uh, on Nero's chopping block, not Nero himself, but under Nero's administration, Paul was beheaded. And yet before the eve of his execution, on the eve of his execution, he was still talking boldly because he was looking forward to seeing Jesus. Well, Apostle Paul had had some experiences. He had, he had uh, been caught up to the third heaven and saw some things that he declared that were unlawful for a man to utter. Then he later said, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of men the good things that God has prepared for those that love him. Here's a man who saw some things. And when he came back to this world, he was looking forward to spending eternity with Jesus. Uh, he even said, I believe it was to the Roman church, he said, you know, I'm betwixt two opinions. Uh, if I stay here, it's profitable to you. But if I go on, it's far greater. So here was a man who had not uh, put his, his treasures in this earth. He had not put his treasures in this world, but worked diligently uh, and looking forward to the rewards in heaven. Well, I, that was not the subject. I just thought about that. Uh, and I've thought of others and even uh, met others that have had what we refer to as NDEs, near-death experiences. And most of them uh, that had those experiences uh, later come back and talk about the peace and the calm that they had in the short period of time they had gone to the other side, had actually died. Uh, one particular fellow I know uh, personally uh, who had died uh, and uh, he talked about the peace that he had. He talked about uh, how he felt. Uh, and he came back into his body. When he came back, the nurses were working on him. You know, he evidently had, uh, had a, 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 died while in his hospital bed. Uh, but he said that uh, henceforth, he's, he's not looking forward to this world. He's just passing through, but looking forward to spending time with Jesus. I believe that's what the Lord wants to put in us. But we don't have to fear. We don't even have to fear what happens in this world because the Lord is on the throne and the Lord God, Jesus, is in control. Hallelujah. God bless you. Now, listen, do this for me. Do this for me. I see some of you are starting to chime in now already. That's very good. Let us know where you are viewing from. Let us know. Just simply chime in. Maywood, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, Detroit. Louisiana or other parts of the world as we sometimes get people that would chime in from various parts of the world. Uh, let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, and also, I want you to hit the share button. I want you to hit the share button uh, so that uh, others can hear and be blessed by what we're about to do. So please do that. Please do that. All right. Let me start off by saying that uh, my new book is is here. We've got the reprint. We've got another stock in. This is the book, The Challenges of the 21st Century Church. If you do not have this book, you need to get this book written by yours truly. Uh, there are several ways that you can get it. I'm going to give you those ways now. You can first of all go uh, to my website. Uh, in fact, it's up on the ribbon there, Scott Bradley Ministries. That's one word, scottbradleyministries.vpweb.com, scottbradleyministries.vpweb.com. Go to my website. There's information on how you can uh, order the book. Uh, you can use your PayPal account, and uh, we will get the book out right out to you. Or there is a quicker way. There is a quicker way. You can go to my Cash App. You, if you have the Cash App, and I don't know how many there are. I know that I have the one uh, with the green dollar sign, uh, and all you need is, the, is a phone number. I'm going to give you that number. 
that all you simply have to do is, is go to the Cash App and dial in this number, 630-730-2319. Uh, do that in the Cash App and make sure that in the uh, memo, you put your name and your address so I will know where to send the book to if you just send me the money when I have nowhere to send it. So make sure, make sure that you put your name and your address in the memo column so that I will know where to send the book to. All right, God bless your hearts. Uh, again, we thank the Lord for this day that the Lord has made. So hit the share button. Let us know where you are viewing from. Praise the Lord, I see some of you viewing in already. God bless your hearts. All right. Uh, let me say this before I go into the word today. This actually is a combination of a couple of messages I was going to do. I, I, I've been kicking uh, back and forth in my mind what to share this week. And uh, rather than try to separate one and wait for I forgot I just put these together. Uh, because they basically are saying, well, let me put it this way. They center around the same thing. So I very easily could divide them up into three, but I could also bring them together. Uh, as one. So that's what I'm going to do today in the time allowed. And we certainly hope that you are blessed <coughs> <pardon me, coughs> by what you receive. Uh, this is coming from St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. I'm sorry, the sixth chapter. This is what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. There's a portion in there that I want to go to uh, because this is what our entire salvation rests upon, this particular uh, portion in this verse. Uh, it says here in the sixth chapter, starting in verse nine, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, notice verse 14 and 15, because I want to focus on that, taken from verse 12. Now, remember, verse 12 says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 14 says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. Now, why is this important? Because, brothers and sisters, our entire salvation rests upon being forgiven. Why is that? Because all have sinned. You know, one of the things that I find very disturbing in the attitude of people today in the 21st century church, and again, I've been around this church practically all of my life. I've traveled the length and breadth of this country as an evangelist and minister of the gospel. I've been to other parts of the world. Uh, and one of the things that I find disturbing in the 21st century church, particularly in America, is the arrogance uh, that people have seemed to take into mind. We 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 have things twisted. I, I say this in my book when I talk about the servant-master relationship, and you've probably heard me say this on numerous occasions over this media. That is that the motive of the servant is to seek and to do the will of his master. That's the motive of the servant. The servant does not impose his will on the master until the master what he's going to do. The servant seeks the will of his master. In other words, master, what would you have me to do? What would you want me to do? Those are the words of Apostle Paul when he was uh, stopped by Jesus on the Damascus, on the Damascus road to, do, uh, 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 to, to uh, imprison the saints and persecute the, the church. Uh, and when Jesus stopped him and said, Paul, uh, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? His response was, who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus, who you persecute. Lord, what would you have me to do? The first response that came from him was a servant attitude. Unfortunately, uh, in this 21st century church, I've noticed that look like that attitude of servitude is no longer among the majority of people, and particularly leaders. Uh, I'm looking at some of these leaders now. Uh, and again, I don't mean to be a throw off or throw off on people or knock people down or cut people down, but I'm just simply telling you that the congregation or the flock follows the example of the leaders. Many leaders, for whatever reason, seem to think that they're royalty. I heard a false doctrine, and I will tell you directly, it is a false doctrine that has gone out among some of these high-profile preachers that are calling themselves gods. Because I'm an offspring of God, therefore I'm a god. I'm a little god. You know, that's the exact same thing that the serpent told Eve, you'll be like God. 
You know, now, somewhere along the way, our arrogance, and that's all it is, our arrogance has gotten ahead of our common sense. Our arrogance has gotten ahead of our servitude. A servant does not call himself God. A servant does not tell other people we're gods. And so consequently, people walk out with an arrogant attitude. Now, first of all, if you're God, you didn't even wake yourself up this morning. How can you be God and you didn't even wake yourself up? You're the recipient of the mercy of God. You're the recipient of the blessing of the Lord. And yet here you walk around calling yourself God. That is a false doctrine and a false teaching. Uh, but I want to deal with what Jesus here said, because I don't want to go too far, because sometimes I'll get upset and go off. Let's, let's keep on track here. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. I want to deal with, with, with three main points here. Repent, forgive, and release. These are three things that will help you in your walk with God to repent. And I believe that this is what God is calling for, for, for first and foremost from the people of God. You know, the Lord does not call for repentance from the world. He calls for repentance from the church. He calls repentance for his people. Uh, you know, I'm looking at uh, this day and time that we're living in, and you all have heard me say, matter of fact, I said this on, on broadcast uh, past. Uh, I said this last week, I believe, that in the beginning of the year, the Lord ministered to my heart and said, what you're going to see in 2019, and here we are in the month of August already, 2019, you're going to see uh, a, 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 an abundance of storms and natural disasters. And we've been seeing it. We've been seeing it, which which proves that the Lord spoke it. You know, uh, uh, an increase in tornadoes, uh, killer tornadoes, uh, earthquakes. I just recently had an earthquake in California. Hurricanes are on the increase. That does look in something like that there's a hurricane actually in the Pacific, uh, which which may miss Hawaii, you know, which would be good if it missed Hawaii, but uh, you know, why is out there all by itself, uh, susceptible to a lot of weather patterns, and yet the Lord has blessed him there. But uh, saying all of that to say this, that we see natural disasters, and when you see the disasters happen like that, it's because God is calling the people to repent. He's trying to get the attention of the people of God. I said this before the 2016 election, that if Donald Trump becomes president, it is a sure sign that the judgment of the Lord is coming to America. I said that then, I say it now. We are in judgment. We are in judgment. America is in judgment. And unless the church humbles, himself, humbles itself and repents, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Uh, you know, whenever people are in an apostate state, backstate state, uh, you know, sometimes the Lord will send oppressive leaders, you know, um, and, and, and we, we see this even so that the confusion uh, within the leadership uh, of the nation. Now, here is a man who thinks nothing of lying, just just lies blatantly. Here's a man who is a racist. And I don't care what y'all say and what he says is not a race bone in his body. His actions, his words, his mannerism speaks racism. The things that he says is a throwback. Now, again, I don't mean to dwell on him. That's another bunny trail. I don't want to go down. But I will say it's a throwback. Uh, things that I remember as a child, you know, particularly go back, you know, that was always told us when I was coming up in school uh, and I had uh, in school where uh, uh, there were predominantly white kids and sometimes they say to us, as black, the handful of blacks that were, and it didn't stay that way, eventually more blacks came, but, but uh, you know, why don't y'all go back to Africa? That's what even the young people would say to me and to some of the other young black students, go back to Africa. There was a rumor, and it was nothing but a rumor, it, it was, it was, not true, but I remember very well the 68 presidential election when there was Nixon versus Humphrey and George Wallace, the avowed segregationist from Alabama, was a third party uh, and ran. Uh, and of course, as I said, he was an avowed segregationist. He stood uh, at the, uh, I think it was Ole Miss, and, and defiantly blocked a black student from enrolling. He said in a speech one day, and it's all documented, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He was an avowed segregationist. Uh, and <clears throat> there was the rumor among young folks, students at the school there, that if Wallace became president, he was going to send all black folk back to Africa. Well, again, that was not going to happen. It was impossible for it to happen, but it was something that we thought about as young people. I'm saying that to say this, that the idea of going back someplace is a throwback to an era 
when racism was more blatant. Now, again, I'm not, don't want to stay on that because I, I'm saying that to say this, that when God brings judgment, in many cases, he does it by bringing an oppressive uh, uh, leadership, an oppressive leadership. And what is God saying? God wants us to repent. Now, I want to say this too. Uh, I've heard people say that, Reverend, you can't uh, touch that man, leave that man alone. God put him in there. Well, that's very true. But God also raised Pharaoh. But God also raised Moses to confront Pharaoh. Uh, and so the idea that, that, that a minister of the gospel, and some of them are disappointing me, believe me, uh, would confront the president or confront the leadership, God told Moses, confront Pharaoh. And I'm telling you in advance, Moses, I'm going to harden his heart. But you confront him. You tell him, thus said God, let my people go. Well, again, I don't mean to jump off on that, but let me let me get back and focus in here. Repentance is what God wants out of his people. He's not calling for repentance from the world. The world is the world. And here's something that we should understand. The world is not going to change. Uh, the only way that the uh, godly utopia is going to be set up is when Jesus returns for the second coming. And he sets his millennial reign on earth, but that's in the future. Right now, this world is never going to do right. This world is going to continue to be filled with hatred. This world is going to continue to be filled with racism. This world is going to continue to be filled with all of the evils of it, but the people of God should have a higher standard. Jesus said you're in the world, but you're not of the world, and therefore the standard of the church should be higher. Unfortunately, that standard has fallen. That standard is not there. You know, you shouldn't hear about uh, fornication and adultery in the church. You shouldn't hear about rebellion in the church. There should not be infighting over simple, silly, stupid stuff in the church. That's not the example that Christ left for us. The pastor is not the king. Pastors, you are not a king and you are not royalty. You are the chief servant. And the servant seeks the will of God to feed his people. Your congregation is not your people. Oh, I know we use that figuratively. Well, that's not church. Those are my people. Yeah, but the reality is they're God's people. And you have to treat God's people right and stop allowing them to make a king out of you. I don't know why I went that way. Praise the Lord. But my point is this. God wants repentance. And so in order to be delivered, there must be repentance. You all know 2 Chronicles 7, 14, most of us know by heart. If my people, what you call by my name, knows my people, not the world. My people, what you call by my name, would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. God says, then will I hear from heaven, forgive the sin and heal the land. So there's repentance. But then, notice our scripture, there is forgiving. Forgiving. Notice that there's a, there's a, there's a, very stunning and sobering statement that Jesus says, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. Brothers and sisters, if you do not forgive, you can't be saved because our entire hope of salvation is being forgiven of our sins. Now stop and think about that because I know sometimes people have a tendency to hold things, hold grudges and and, uh, oh, I, I've known people that they even blatantly said, I'll never forgive you for what you've done. You know, and, and, and the reality is uh, a lot of times the devil will hold, cause us to hold things uh, because the devil knows that it'll eat away at us. Holding unforgiveness eats away at us. It, it, it can destroy us uh, not speaking to folk, you know, and you, and, you, and you fall out. You know, sometimes people fall out and stop speaking for years, and, and they've been... They've been in that status for so long until they forgot what they even mad about. Forgot what you even did. Years ago, I don't even know I'm mad. I ain't speaking to you no more. You know, you just, isn't that silly? And why be lost over something like that? Sometimes we ought to stop and think. And sometimes I do stop and think. How long is forever? How long is forever? Is it worth holding a grudge and lose your soul forever in the torches and torments of hell? And you ain't never getting out just because you wouldn't forgive somebody. Is it worth it? Sometimes I think we ought to stop and talk to ourselves and ask ourselves some sobering questions. Is my being mad at you the rest of my life worth going to hell for? Is my not forgiving you 
no matter what you did. And I know that some of you, and let me say this to you, brothers and sisters, because I've ministered to rape victims. Rape is a horrible thing. I'm not going to tell you that it, it's not horrible. I'm, I'm not going to tell you all oh, get over it. I'm not going to say that to you because that's ridiculous and ludicrous to even say such a thing to a victim of rape. Oh, just get over it. No, no. I understand how devastating it can be. And in fact, the person that violated you is wrong. He, he Oh, every name you can think of, yeah. However, here's something you must understand. Is that person who violated you worth losing your soul over? Because he'll win twice. Now, now I want you to think. You, you may be throwing on, blowing me off, and you'll go, you don't, no, no, no. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. And you may not get it now, but hopefully you'll get it later. You'll get it before you leave this world, hopefully. But if that individual, that dog, that, that, that horrible person has violated you, he's won the first round. But if you hold that against him and not forgive him and you die and go to hell, he wins again. Do you think he deserves to win another time? Do you think he deserves? Now, between him and God, you know, God's going to deal with him. Don't you worry. God's going to deal. The old folk had a saying, you get by, but you ain't going to get away. He may have lied in court, and, and you know, because I understand that uh, sometimes uh, rape Rape is so hard to prove when you go to court and it's humiliating all that kind of stuff. And, and oh, my God, it, it, you know, I understand that. Uh, but sometimes you have to look, see here. Jesus, my relationship with you means more than anything. My walk with you means more than anything. My love for you means more than anything. And so if what this individual did to me is going to hinder me from my love for you and my walk with you, I'm going to forgive him and get him out of my life. I don't need to see him no more, but I forgive him because I want to walk with you. And walking with you is more important. Living for you is more important. I can be healed. And yes, brothers and sisters, you can be healed from any situation. You can be healed from any pain. You can be healed and delivered. But you've got to give it to Jesus. Uh, a lot of times when we don't forgive, there are a number of things that can happen. Uh, it can hinder future relationships. You know, uh, I've I've counseled marriages, and I haven't done a lot of that. Let me let me be very clear with you. But I've I've talked to folk uh, in marriage, and uh, sometime uh, the in some in many cases it's the it's the, it's the woman it's, it's the female, not always, but in many cases the female who had a bad relationship with a man, generally her father or her uncle or something happened, and as a result of not forgiving. Uh, it, 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 it hindered the relationship even in her marriage uh, because she still holds stuff that happened to her. Uh, and so she cannot uh, fully give herself over. Uh, she has trouble sexually. She has trouble uh, in the relationship. Uh, she falls into moods. And that's the effect of not forgiving. And then my third point, not releasing. Some things you just have to let go. Some things you can do nothing about. And because you know nothing about it, uh, or can do nothing about it, you just have to release it. You know, all of us have been done wrong. I've been done wrong. Oh, yeah, in my life, I've had folk do me wrong, supposed to be saved, supposed to love the Lord, did me wrong, preachers, done me wrong. Oh, yeah, all of us have had that happen to us. Uh, even, I think David said uh, that uh, my friends lifted up their heels against me. Uh, some of the people that were close to him turned on him. Uh, even you read uh, when they had re returned to Ziklag and the enemy had burned the tents of, of, of David's gang. David actually had a gang, about 500 men following him. And, and when they uh, returned to the city of Ziklag, they discovered that uh, their, 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 their tents had been pillaged and burnt with fire and their families had been taken away and taken captive. And the Bible says every man wept until he had no power to weep no more. When they got done crying, they look to blame it on David. Now, David is against 500 men, his, his boys, his, his gang, his posse. Yeah, and now all of them turned on him, 500. And the Bible said that David had to encourage himself. You know why? Because he was not going to get a single word of encouragement from anybody around him. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you have to learn to talk to yourself. How many times have I been upset about something? 
and I had to get in the car by myself and just drive and talk. And I imagine people that may have looked over saw me in the car talking to invisible people because I put these people in the car and talk to them and let them know how I feel. They probably figure that guy's crazy. He's not talking. Maybe so. But you know what? Once I release myself, once I, once I talk myself out, and I found out sometimes even in counseling people, sometimes you just have to let people talk because it's a way of release. Sometimes you need to get by yourself and just talk. Talk to that person, even though they ain't there. As a matter of fact, this has saved many marriages, I, I've told folk. And uh, you must understand, my wife and I, God bless Sister Cassie Bear, my wife of 38 years. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that I've never been 38 years, never been mad at her. <laughs> Plenty of times she's been mad at me. You know, uh, it, it, that's the way it is. Just like some of y'all that married, you've been mad at your husband, you've been mad at your wife. Y'all, so don't look at me funny when I tell you I've been mad at her. But I learned that, that sometimes uh, I have to say things to her. And I, if I say them to him, when you say stuff, a lot of times you can't take it back. And what I would do is sometimes I would get in the car and just drive and pretend like she was in the car and say what I want to say because I had to release myself, had to release myself. Uh, we have to release the past. We have to release pain. Some things are hurting you. Some things that you're carrying in your spirit are painful. They hurt you. And, and that's why the Bible says uh, in the book of Proverbs 18 and 14, I believe it is, that the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. Your spirit, you're actually two-thirds spiritual, only one-third physical. And would you believe if I told you a lot of times your physical ailment or your physical sickness is not really the source of your trouble. A lot of times your physical body is reacting to deeper afflictions, affliction in the spirit, heartbreak, pain and suffering in your mind. You know, we used to have a saying when I was growing up in school, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You know, that's not true. Names do hurt. And most complexes that we carry into our adult life, most complexes, go back to childhood on how they taunted you and tortured you, tortured you over, over certain things. You know, they made fun of certain features. They talked about your big head, talked about you, called you big head all your life. All your life, you've been called big head. And even to this day, you might be a grown man, grown woman, but still conscious of the fact that they talked about your big head, you know, uh, big feet, all, all the feet, big ears, you know, all of the uh, physical flaws. Uh, we as black folk, we got color complexes. Y'all know that's right. You know, too light, too dark, high yellow, blue, black. I mean, they call us all kind of names, you know. I mean, they're, 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 they're all types of complexes. But you will note that you did not get those complexes as an adult. You got those complexes as a child. And they followed you into adulthood. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is release something that's been with you for so long. Because when people remind you of it, it causes pain. You you get angry. You know, I've all the time said, you, you know, you a person can be in the spirit, praising the Lord in the spirit, but hit their complex. They'll come out the spirit real fast because you hit something deep inside of them. See, and so this is why it's important for us to learn to release. Let it go. I know a woman to this day, and it's my mistake. I will admit to you it's my mistake, but I know a, a, a woman to this day who still holds against me Something I said to her when we were teenagers. Now, I'm a man of 60 years old now. How long ago has that been since I was a teenager? It's been quite a while ago. But that sister still holds against me something I said to her. And I've apologized to her. Uh, and I look back at, 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 as a mature mind. I realize what I said I should not have said. I realize what I said it was, it was dumb to say it. And I've admitted as such. But she still holds that thing. And I say, sister, you got to release that. Don't be lost because of something I said to you, because you know what? I've repented, and I'm going to heaven. Now, what is it going to look like? You mad at me over something I said, my God, how long ago? 40 years ago? You're going to hold something that I said to you 40 years ago. I repented, and I'm going on. You're going to hold on to it and be lost. How much sense does that make? Release it. Let go. Repent. Release that past. And so, again, as I prepare, as our time is about up here, I want to, again, go over it again. We want to repent. Repent means to turn from our ways, to follow the ways of God, just as Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. We want to forgive. You will not be saved unless you forgive. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. 
and then we want to release. Hallelujah. You know what Apostle Paul said? Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All right, brothers and sisters, our time is up. Listen, go to our website, get my latest book, The Challenges of the 21st Century Church. Much of what we say and talk about is in this book. Uh, you can also go to the Cash app. Go to this number, 630-730-2319 on the Cash app. Uh, the information will come up. You can purchase the book. Now, the book purchase is for $15.50. That includes shipping and handling. $15.15. Go to the Cash app. Uh, put that in. And in the memo, make sure that you put your name and your address so that I will know where to send it to. All right. Where are you all viewing from? Let me know where you're viewing from. Where you know where you're viewing from? Uh, our time is about up here. We're going to have to go, but I thank God for some of you that I see here. Uh, somebody out of North Dakota I saw. That's Pinky. Sister Pinky, God bless your heart. Yeah, I think I saw you out of North Dakota. Isn't that all right? Uh, I got a few Maywoods here. Praise the Lord. Bellwood, there's somebody. Amen. Uh, amen. Glenn Ellen, I see my cousin Massey. Bless you, sir. Amen. And uh, a few other people here. All right, God bless you. We thank God for you. Amen. Until next week, this is Scott Bradley saying God bless you. We hope that we share a word with you today that will encourage your heart, that will bless you, that you repent, forgive, and release, and you will be blessed. God bless. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk it for himself. Nobody else could walk.